Stop the Week with Robert Robinson. Hello, our conversation this evening comes from Anne Leslie, the journalist, Stephen Oliver, the composer, the Reverend Roger Royal, and Laurie Taylor, Professor of Sociology at York University. We have music from Dilly Keane of Fascinating Aida. Uh, certain events get reported, but they never take place. You know, like going to the moon, which I'm fairly certain was mocked up in a garage near Luton. But above <laughs> all, cocktail mixing competitions, which are traditionally alleged to take place at the Savoy Hotel. They said there was one this week, and I dare say the winning cocktail was blue. They always are. But since no one's been seen drinking a cocktail since about 1934, I frankly don't believe it. You put tomato juice into gin or water into whiskey. But when were you last in a pub where a chap in faultless evening dress was ordering Tesco sours, three amaretto heart warmers and a Baltimore eggnog? <laughs> Glasses with handles, of course, landlord. I don't see any of you mixing two teaspoons full of sugar and syrup with three dashes of bitters, adding an ounce and a half of rye whiskey, a splash of curacao, ice, a twist of lemon, a slice of orange and a maraschino cherry, then settling down in your Urkel recliner to enjoy an old-fashioned yeah, can of Foster's, possibly, but I do not cocktail. Well, I think the, 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 where you said the Urkel recliner, it immediately oh. puts you into the period of the cocktail. That's why, why we don't have them now. I mean, to me, the cocktails mean entirely people wearing uh, crepe de chine pyjama sets and with uh, cigarette holders, and it's a little Nancy Cunard and the Duchess of Windsor. The embarrassing thing is, actually, I actually like cocktails, but I wouldn't dream, as you say, of going into a pub and actually asking for one. I loathe to sound like a trendy vicar, but cocktails are very popular indeed today. You go to discos <laughs> and cocktails <laughs> are served. Being contrary. No <laughs> cocktails are served left, right, and centre. You can't get your glass near for the umbrella, so you're very damaging to the eyes because it's so dark, but they are very popular. And it's one up from the pub because you reckon on paying, say, two fifty, three pounds for a cocktail. So you only have two of those, and it's just that little bit more. Classy. They don't go out a lot. This crowd. Yes, they do. They're very protected. But no, just tell me that what what you, you do, can you. Do I hear your dulcet tones ask for, what will you have, Vicar? Oh, I think mine's a cocktail. Well, no, you I, have a... I wouldn't, because I loathe them. And I, yeah. I hate any drink that has a monkey on a stick in the middle of it, because yeah. that's just not a drink to me. No, no, but, quite. Uh, but a lot of the young people do. Oh, really? Oh, okay. you... Arcane historical <laughs> foot footnote to me, because I'm not very fond of alcohol, and indeed asking me about cocktails is analogous to asking John Knox if he can recommend a good <laughs> Catholic school. But, but, but there is one curious thing about non-alcoholic cocktails, of which there is a sort of sub-breed of the cocktail. Mm. And the odd thing is, whatever they're made of, however judiciously they're compounded of pomegranates or kiwi fruits or pineapple or, for all I know, the marrow of a roasted cat, they always end up looking, tasting, and with the exact consistency of cold blood. I don't oh, know really? why that is. I say, I they say. Are very I think dangerous. that makes them sound there far are. more interesting. I just, I, I'll tell you, I just, a, I was swatting up a few names. You don't think that I carry names like what was it called? An amaretto heart warmer around with me. But I was given, like everyone's been given, one of those little slim books by someone who mm. doesn't know me very well and couldn't think of what to give me at Every Christmas, Christmas time, and it arose as a a, 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 a thing that she ought to do, and. Um, it, it, people read about them, but they don't mix them. And I'll tell you why. I've got a marvellous quote here. The reason people only read these books don't actually make the drinks they describe, it's all summed up in the opening line of a recipe for a cocktail called, I don't really know how to pronounce it, a grand quetch, probably grand quetch or something like that, Q-U-E-T-S-C-H. The writer of the book says, a chance to use the superb white dry brandy of the Switzerland plum. Now, <laughs> there, what British home is without its dry, light white brandy <laughs> of the no, Switzerland plum? It's that is just, no, you can you... reach out. What housewife's larder is so meagre that it isn't there? Couple of bottles always next to the bistow. <laughs> you know who, who, who has those things? It's, of course, when you go uh, on holiday, you, you, you find all over Central Europe people who are trying to spend their zlotties or whatever, and they can't find any souvenirs, so they take back some oh, local yeah, yeah, specialised yeah, brandy yeah. or something, which is that. perfectly but disgusting, also... and that's why they turn them into cocktails. But it's, making cocktails is entirely a, a masculine pursuit, I've noticed. The sort of person who goes in for making cocktails is the chap who's, who's got a built-in barbecue on the patio and wears those sort of uh, aprons with sort of barbecue jokes on, and he makes cocktails. What is delightful, if you are in New York where they drink a lot of cocktails and have gone 
on drinking them right the way through from the 30s, for all I know, is the sight of someone mixing the cocktail, which is rather equivalent to watching someone playing uh, an electric organ. It's like someone sitting inside a jukebox, the way in which they dash between those coloured bottles, those coloured optics behind the bar, mix in, squeeze, shake, and then pour out. And the most delicious thing of all is pour, perhaps they're making three of the same, so there is nothing whatsoever left in the cocktail shaker, but they exactly fill three glasses. Now, the delight, as was discovered when, in fact, tours to the Parisian sewers were first started in 18 90, the delight of watching other people work hard and work well is, un- is, 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 is very difficult to top. But like, Roger, it, it's that treatment, that uh, bit of the excitement, you know, it, it's something really extravagant. I go on holiday every year with Woman's Realm readers on a holiday called Find a Friend. <laughs> You're making this up. <laughs> no, no, I don't. No, every summer. It's so and, and always. It's the pina colada. Exactly. To <laughs> when it is the, it's exactly that. Bone boring. corset. And when they're wanting, it's the big night. I mean, it, for instance, it's the finals of the fancy dress. Then it's cocktail time because that adds to the excitement adds to the extravagance what the dickens are you doing there taking pastoral care and bringing a lot of happiness i see <laughs> <laughs> you can't say fairer than that i think the viciousness of cocktails is not only in themselves but their causes are vicious aren't they uh, take for instance the cocktail party surely one of the most exiguous sort of entertainments ever devised uh, where really what what i always end up with in a cocktail party is a piece of gaseous water and that horror which is known as cartoned orange juice but <laughs> really what one needs at a cocktail party is a cup of tea and a plate of mixed biscuits <laughs> you're not you don't but drink you alcohol see, you see, the thing is you never uh, have the ingredients though you never have the ingredients one cocktail i once did drink and i must say i drank it with great enjoyment in mexico or, or as we called it mexico uh, was a margarita uh, made of all this that and the other tasted like alcoholic seawater most refreshing but very easy to drink because everyone else was doing or everything was available that's what you did like you had a whiskey and water at home that's what you'd have there I brought back a my duty-free bottle of tequila and I thought I'll try and assemble one of these so you know you have to have um, tequila and Cointreau I think it is and lime squeeze of lime and I think that's about it but of course no, the glass has got to have salt round the rim so there I was standing I just got one step in the wrong order I got a saucer of salt in one hand and a full glass in the other and I thought by what miracle of physics am I going to turn the glass upside down and not let the stuff run out but there the only trouble is when I'm in this New York cocktail bars and you see all this sort of cha-cha-cha with the cocktail shaker going on and all this flying around between the bottles I feel I have to live up to all of this and start uttering those awful Algonquin round table remarks like one more drink and I'll be under the host or you know let's get out of these white wet clothes and into a dry martini and I feel I'm not living up to the sense of theatre there so that's why in fact when I ever have to order a cocktail I actually boringly give all its constituent parts which is a warning to the barman that I don't want his common Miranda Act. We'll get on to something else now. Thank you for this <laughs> conversation. <laughs> on to the, uh, the more rarefied heights. I want, you, I want you all now to hand those holiday snaps uh, back to Laurie this time. <laughs> it was darling of him to let us see them all, and so many, too. He brought them along to illustrate some point he's rather anxious to make. Yeah, there are a lot of them, really. I, I was, and indeed, I was at it again this morning, putting uh, some of these 420 photographs that I've taken in the last six weeks in some sort of order and trying to decide which ones to keep. This one of my friends and Andy marking essays, or this one of my mother pouring tea, or this one of Dad asleep by the living room fire, or this one of Bob in the studio doing nothing much but looking disdainful. It's not an aesthetic choice that I'm making. There are no carefully posed portraits here, no coy pictures of fishing nets or dusk across the med, no prints of exploding milk drops done in slow motion. I've never really believed that good old photography could sustain such pretensions. No, nearly all my pictures are spontaneous, sudden, natural, all taken, uh, all taken oh, with a brand new Foolproof automatic focus camera. Listen, all developed, seen them, all <laughs> developed at great speed. At the moment, it's a whole 12 hours they take to develop. But from next week, I'll be using the new professional 25 minute laboratory that's just opened in Regent Street. Now, I particularly love my pictures of faces. No profiles, of course. They're full frontal. Do you mind? Thank you very much. Instances of reality which say so clearly, hey, this is him or her. It's no matter that most people give the camera a special look. That's a look which shouts their identity by trying to protect it. 
modest, assertive, heroic, passive. Now, I don't expect everyone to share my new pleasure. Already there are rumblings of discontent <laughs> from some of the whimsical amateurs, unhappy with the idea of millions of cheerful, foolproof snappers encroaching on their domain. Bob, for example, strikes me as, well, a fishing nets at dusk man. <laughs> well, I don't know. Of course, truth must be combined with civility, and I, I don't really know what the kind thing to say is. I mean, I think Laurie's fantasy that somehow simply pressing a button on a piece of apparatus will somehow create a picture is a fairly widespread one, rather like writers who get better and better word processes and hope that one day the processor will compose the damn stuff. But there are no magic wands, and uh, the camera only takes something, sees something itself, if you're seeing it too. And uh, I just I, yeah, this is how I'm going to put it, really. Laurie's autom automatic camera, that's the great, that's the, the essence of what it's all about. Automatic camera, it's produced perfectly lit, perfectly exposed, pin-sharp snaps, but the effect, and I, I do have to say this, I do have to, the effect is of a series of blurs in perfect focus. People with cameras are divided into three groups, really. There's the professionals, you know, the Henri Cartier presence and things. We'll leave them out of consideration. I think that's wise. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I then, don't want to. We then have the amateur photographer. Now, that is the name of a cult, actually. What Laurie is in, and he's in danger since he is so enthused of moving from snapshotter up to amateur photographer, but at the moment he's definitely in snapshotter. And the snapshotter has got this idea that you're catching spontaneous reality. Of the notice board of behind the, the object. Board. Yes, you are. In a I way, you doing are. That all, right? You are catching that. I mean, for example, do you remember those pictures not long ago uh, Prince Andrew took of his mum on her 60th birthday? They were lousy photographs, but they were great snapshots. And one of the reasons they were great snapshots was there were vases growing out of Her Majesty's <laughs> shoulders, if you remember. Yes. Now, it is absolute rule of snapshotters is that all photographs of loved ones should have have something poking out of their anatomy. Mum must always have a telegraph pole sticking out of the top of her head. And that's because the snapshotter is wanting to take the person and not the picture. Try not to undermine what, my witnesses. What, what, what has all this got to do with the personalities that you're addressing these ghastly instruments to? I mean, what has taking photographs you're of people's the camera faces... Per se, Absolutely. I, oh, yes. I, uh, I, the, I mean, <laughs> the camera itself, I mean, the whole idea of holiday photographs seemed to me, it doesn't worry me so much that they are exemplar of the seven deadly sins. Pride, we've been there. Envy, you haven't. Wrath, how dare they show off. Lust, who's that girl on the left of the picture? Gluttony and avarice in that you uh, combine the experience, you photograph the experience so you can repeat it again and again without diminishing it. Not at all. That doesn't worry me at all. What worries me about photographs, particularly holiday and casual photographs, is that they're damnable in the way that Faust, uh, when <laughs> you remember when go. Faust... Yeah, absolutely. Faust you remember, the, the reason guns. that Faust thinks he is damnable is when he he says to Mephistopheles in Goethe's play, he says, um, you can take me away to hell when I say, freeze that moment. The moment when you want to preserve something is the moment you're damning it. Because oh, we damning. live now. Time. Now, uh, time to ask the vicar to I'm comment. absolutely right. But, Laurie, this is a new fan of yours, isn't it? Well, it's six weeks old. Yes. yes. Well, you see, <laughs> converts are always dangerous. Um, they're yeah, always very difficult. And you have no right to defend the photographs unless you go to as many weddings as I go to. <laughs> Because once you go to weddings and you see the photographs that are done then, you can never, ever defend photography again. You stand for hours outside the church. You're desperate. You've done a lovely wedding, very sincere, meaningful, lasting, with a lifelong guarantee. You get outside. You then spend three quarters of an hour as groups are rearranged. An auntie is then forgotten to get into the picture, so it has to be redone again. You cannot defend photography. But, but no, you can, because he's... I, I will say this for him. I mean, there's not much to be said for him and the camera, but he's not talking about that sort of thing. Quite the opposite. No, I, can I... I just just come back to what Anne was saying, and what's because I think what Anne and Stephen are saying, I, I think I can combine this in, in some sort of defence well, of my position. Theme. Yes, <laughs> it, oddly enough, it yes. may take me three quarters to an hour, <laughs> but I will get there. I will get there. It'll be a long exposure. But uh, no, because it is true that what I'm interested in is person photography. The way in which almost any photograph, quickly taken, unposed, captures something about a person. It's not what they're attempting to give you, but when you look at it, you are seized by this peculiar quality around them. There is something about them which you can see in it, not in all photographs. When I'm sifting through these several hundred that I was describing this morning, some, I suddenly say, there is something about that one. In the same way that when I look through
through the snapshots in my mother's album, I say, there is something about father there, or there is something about my sister Madeline there that I recognize. Nothing particularly to do with the way the picture was taken or the posing of it, but some attitude towards the camera, which represents almost their attitude well, towards the there's, there's an element there, but the principle, the principle principle that underlies what you've just now said, underlies the sort of geezer who leaves um, a tape recorder running at a party in the hope of getting mm. something absolutely <laughs> understood. What he gets is confusion. No, why it's different? Let me tell you why it's different. Can I, I think just want to make this point. Yes. Every 400 photographs, no doubt you will get your no, no, dad no, in character. Let me contradict you. If you leave the tape recorder running, you, in fact, are not asking people to speak into it. When I take photographs, I'm saying to people, uh, here you are, you have a second in which to pose, imitate ah, yourself, mm -hmm. if you like. I mean, well, they are... Well. Now, I remember that Nigel Inglis, who's a professional photographer, who I got a great admiration, actually going to a school in Leeds to t take some photographs of children and simply saying to them, pose for me as you would like to be seen. And then the kids strike particular poses, and it's a tremendous set of photographs. That's quite interesting, now, with Andre. adults, even when you say, well, I will now take a picture of you, I said that a few moments before we started talking, and Stephen got into some sort of position <laughs> state. Now, when I look at that photograph, that is Stephen, in a way, getting ready to not to be photographed, okay. trying not to be. It, but it says a great deal about him. And coming back to your Faust point, if I may, stuff indeed, uh, back to the Faust point, there is right, there is a sort of death in it, but I don't think it's a damnation in it. It is there something sees, something still. It is evidence of a biography. I don't say Laurie's ignorant. I mean, a friend of mine <laughs> was given a camera as a present, as often this happens, used it back to front and took 24 perfect exposures of his own right ear. He won't do that. He, he knows how to work the mechanism. But I what don't... Laurie does... I'll, I'll give you a yes. bit more ammunition. What you do, it seems to me, is to see everything, but you take everything that you don't need to take as well as what you do need. Because your fancy explanation, well, it'll do, but the pictures I've seen, I wouldn't have thought that. That wasn't the explanation that leapt to my mind. Well, well you see, it's quite right to say, I would uh, agree, I think it was Brecht who said that the camera... And the, the ...photography has no, no, but has no critical power. It, it doesn't. Uh, it's absolutely true, and it has no way to balance. There is nothing... I don't think you can read into photographs, and photographs which set themselves up to be read are pretentious and a waste of time. They are masquerading Tell as art. Tell that to Cartier-Bresson. No, 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 but, but Cartier-Bresson's no, photographs are masquerading as art, and I think that no, they're therefore... They're not. Yes, no, I think... That's that, documentary. Yes, no, they I, are I, I think so. It's and, edited and, and therefore, reality. And, so, and I think, therefore, that you can't read in, but they, they are particular pieces, as I said before, of biographical evidence, which stand by themselves. And therefore, what I believe that these new foolproof cameras do and this quick developing, it provides a chance for photography to be what it is, and not for it to be I some sort of right. substitute for art as it has been in but, the past. But, no, I mean, that, I, that I is perfectly right yes. if you're keeping those photographs to yourself agree. and your own reaction to them. It's when they're handed round that the difficulty mm, comes, because right. you know when it was taken, you know the attitude of the person at that moment. That is absolutely fine, but I'm not for flashing them all over No, the I mean, I think that's an apologia that really won't wash the one you've just given for the automatic camera. You see, the, the, you have nat people have natural with rhythm when they die. It's no good beating about the bush. It's me. I mean, you can't teach anyone that. And someone has a common sense eye for what he looks at, and he makes the camera do it. Now, when I take a picture, <laughs> I wish I could get the hang of the mechanism. Uh, you, I, I sort of sometimes the film doesn't wind on, the focus isn't right, and oh, I get quite a lot of that purple blur, that sort of stripy bit at the left hand side, which proves I didn't close the back of the damn thing and the lights got in. But what I claim about my pictures is that you can dimly see the sort of picture I might have taken. With Laurie's pictures, I have to say it again, an unkind note on which to end before our song, all you can see is that the mechanism is working perfectly. More than that now, however, from Dilly. Her mechanism is always in perfect working order, but the imagination is added there too. I'm saying all this while I find out what the name of her song is. I wrote it down. Yes, Snap. Five in the morning in a darkened alley, quiet as a mouse. Waiting for the moment when a certain celebrity leaves this house. Lonely vigil all through the night Whether if the pictures come out right Famous people shouldn't have affairs But it's free publicity, so who cares? And my profession depends on theirs I'm paparazzi Snap Got him with his pants down Snap Caught him in the act Now we've got him by the short and curlies The camera never lies and that's a fact Standing in the rain outside, a nightclub soaked to the skin. Just 
Cramming the space with the other photographers Not allowed in Aging rock stars mingling with the knobs Footballs, marbles, actors out of jobs Fading starlets desperate to pose They're not amused on bother with those It's the big fish that matter as everybody knows To the paparazzi Flash Did you get the gesture? Flash Two fingers in the air Not quite what you'd expect from a royal Of course it really happened I was there Secret location. Monitor the movements of a beautiful singer who's on vacation. Hasn't got a clue that I'm up here. Got my telephoto focus clear. Starting to look like she's over the hill. Don't think she'll like the pictures. Still, if I don't take them, someone else will. Another paparazzo. Click. Got her with a wig off. Click. She looked a bloody mess There's a girl who doesn't like the daylight Still it makes a story for the national press The snapshots put to music Well done, Diddy Now, um, we've been looking at this book called Objects of Desire I think it's a lovely title But I'll leave Stephen to tell you why If he agrees with me, I don't know But he probably wants to say something else first Well, it's a fascinating book Indeed, it's rather frustrating after years on this programme Happily scratching what must be called the soft underbelly of English letters (laughs) To have to deal so briefly with a book so fertile of ideas But uh, I think you can distinguish this man's main thesis with adequate brevity Which is, it's a mistake to think, he says It's a mistake to think that designers, when inventing our washing machines or lavatory pans or whatever, have a free hand. Well, it would be polite to characterise this thought as being free from paradox, or in plainer language, who denies of it, Betsy? Whoever <laughs> thought that a designer's eye, in a fine frenzy rolling, threw out an exquisite little coal scuttle or jam pot, without considering that people have got to think it useful or beautiful or even simply amusing enough to want to buy it. I don't even agree with Mr. Forty, who's the author of this book, when he goes on to contrast the commercial restraints laid upon the designer with the freedom of the artist, responsible to no one for, not, for what he does. But this is gammon, one of, one of the glories of art, as of design, is precisely this interaction between the artist or designer and conditions of performance. Handel's oratorios wouldn't exist if the theatres for his operas hadn't been closed during Lent. Would Mozart have written the piano concertos? if he hadn't needed to exploit his own dexterity merely to get the punters into the concert hall. But we're talking about design, and the only rider I'd really make to his thesis would be this. It's necessary for the point he's making, that designers aren't free to do what they like, that we should think of manufacturers and designers and consumers as different sorts of people. He complains, for instance, of a 50s sitting room, that all the design decisions made in it were made by manufacturers or people with social axes to grind. But even manufacturers and sociologists use sitting rooms themselves. Mightn't they have simply wanted the sort of rooms they like to live in? We have it on the highest authority, the vicar will confirm, that we are members one of another. Isn't that particularly true of social living? Isn't the way that things are designed a far more communal process than even Mr. Forty would have us believe? Well, you make it sound a degree too nice. What you said about Mozart and Handel seems perfectly true. You've got to do it well enough. You've really got to sort of tickle the punter so that he gets up out of the chair and actually goes in the theatre or buys the thing. Because why I say you make it sound a degree too nice, it's got very little to do with being members one of another or of appreciation of the aesthetic shapes, uh, the uh, uh, tradition in which the object might be placed or anything like that. It is to do with appetite. What Mozart, Handel and the fellow who makes the Sonny Walkman they're all trying to do is make you get up out of your seat and go and buy the thing. It really is the appetite. It's the lust to possess that this kind of design awakens and it's got to be very strong otherwise you wouldn't be motivated to get up and buy it. You've got to refine and what he does do is to refine that lust to possess because I mean it turns often from straightforward need needs into, if you like, that lust to possess, because that possession confers an identity on you. Now, what capitalism is doing is creating all sorts of products and persuading all sorts of people to believe that they can distinguish themselves each from the other by possession of those products. Now, and that I, is I, creating... I would alter one thing only. <laughs> I think that may well turn out to be what it's trying to do, along with advertising, which is the uh, the, the handmaiden of this sort of design. But what you two, and I think what this author should be humble enough to recognise, is that he's actually 
at the basis of it, dealing with a mystery, to mm. find out why so. Isigonis's mini motor car exactly filled a mini motor car shaped gap in the appetites of everyone is a far more more difficult thing than this author lets lets it on I to think be. That, I think we may find, never know. People find a tremendous security within design. I, I found it fascinating the chapter on corporate identity to go back to the monastic life when people were living in their own little cells, doing precisely what they wanted to do, where they wanted to do it, with just allegiance to the Pope. And up came the monasteries, designing on a set pattern. So once monks were on the move, they were like staying at a holiday inn because they would always know where the refectory was, they would always know where the chapel was, and something like this. And this was creating both a discipline and a security. What is interesting is that what is revived here is the importance of the manufacturer, of the entrepreneur, of the person making those choices, which interferes with that peculiarly irritating obsession that people have with the handmade, mm -hmm. with that idea of the Harris Tweed which has been hand-woven by an individual person, with the idea of individuality in design. I mean, and what it does, it replaces it, this book. I mean, you have to use the word sociological. It has to replace it with, with an entrepreneur sitting in an office with a factory out there waiting to sell stuff, faced with thousands of designs in front of him. And he says, right, oh, well, let's go for this one and this one and this one. And they plump them out. Two or three fail. One is successful. And that is then elevated into the mythology mm. of yes, design. Yes, what you have to be clear about is there was no sentimental attachment to the handmade article before all this started. I mean, because it couldn't be. They were all handmade. Yes. Bar There's one a significant yeah, any afterwards. You get a nostalgia for but the handmade thing. There are very thing. few people who are going for the handmade. I mean, it's very, very few indeed. There, there aren't a vast number of people. I mean, a lot of people would long for it, but they just cannot afford it. So they don't, it doesn't enter into their world. And this is why things like designer jeans have caught on. Now, designer jeans are all exactly the same. It's just they have a different label stuck on the back. Yes, I, I, I always <laughs> have to think twice when that phrase is used. Exactly. Is it sort of, you know, biological or is it? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 just going on to that, a friend of mine who said she'd gone to stay, it was a very rich American, and she said, my God, I mean, what a hostess. Do you know, by the bedside, there's designer biscuits and designer water. <laughs> <laughs> but, but go, sorry, I was just going to say about what, really, that was Ah, that was a preliminary. No, yeah. it was, I was just distracted about the designer jeans, because I wanted, wanted to pick up, it was about the manufacturers. What I thought came out of this is usually it's always the artist who is supposed to be the person who's got this curious uh, plug uh, which, uh, or piece of wire in his head which he can plug into the national mood. What comes out of this, and the, the manufacturers are the thickies, the manufacturers, the successful ones anyway, seem to be extraordinarily good at plugging into a feeling. Now, when you look at, for example, the um, vacuum cleaner, uh, this book told me that when the vacuum cleaner was first invented for the home, it looked like a factory cleaner because it was going to be used by the servants. And who cares? The servants are paid. They are, in a sense, in a domestic factory. But then when the servants went and of course, naturally enough, the servants went, then the wife was going to have to do the cleaning. And because at that stage there was the feeling that the woman, uh, woman's you know, true fulfillment was in creating a lovely home for her man, which was not work. It was not considered to be work, because if it was considered to be work, all sorts of problems come into that. It was supposed to be an expression of love, although it was dreary, factory-type work. Then the manufacturers realized that the vacuum cleaner would not sell if it still looked industrial. That's almost as sentimentally inspirational. In, in divining what the impulse might be as saying it was really all down to Michelangelo or someone with a mm. especially perceptive vision. It, it's but a Stephen. much more complex relationship, isn't it, between artefacts and, and how they're designed. I think of the whole idea of writing down music, which took us, I may say, 600 years to work out the best way to do it. And this grid system that was invented in 1500 actually not only helped to notate the music they were writing then, but in, helped to invent a completely different sort of music. So if you design something, you're already starting oh, yes, a, a pathway oh, yes. going somewhere you're, you're, else. You're Surely changing that's... from one vocabulary to another, but yet, curiously, in this way it happens, using the old vocabulary even to speak of the exactly. new vocabulary. There is right. something almost theological, in a way, about the ways in which... The vicar will decide that. Yes, about, that. about <laughs> the ways in which particular... This is, I was, I was half-turned towards him already, but there were, the ways in which Preferring ordinary substances can be successfully divided up into different kinds and then retail... I remember that, you see, my father was a person who never who never appreciated the ways in which designs 
uh, operated within the world. And whenever my mother would go out to buy some Vaseline, he'd say, don't buy Vaseline, it's petroleum jelly. Ask them for a pound and a half of petroleum jelly, then bring it back and you'll have enough Vaseline to last you forever. And the other day when I went out, and I went to get some lip salve, and I went out and I bought a tiny, tiny tube, which was called Lippo or Salvo or Blisties or something like that. And it was so tiny, it was so small, it was a a fraction of the size of one lip. And I carried it home, and I looked at it, and I read the inscription, and it said it was petroleum (laughs) jelly. Well, now, Salvo would be an excellent name for a suppository, but that's going to come to the lips. You see, what you've just told, in a way, is just like one of these photographs in this book, or one of these chapters, or one of these paragraphs, because one of the attractive features of the book, I mean, not sternly scientific at all, is that all these pictures and all these uh, accounts of various designs are glimpses of lives, which is what you were just giving, anecdotal glimpses of lives. He seems to be a bit, oh, I don't know, snooty about... um, wireless is being concealed at one time in what looked like Queen Anne cupboards and he said something about the original wireless being unashamedly technological but the unashamedly technological makes the original design sound as though it was being oh superior in a candid way its candor was to be patted on the back but it was pro- it was merely proclaiming its technology in a way that we now hide it behind I think it's a manufacturing word sleekness mm. and in hiding it also proclaim it. So I think it's a sort of designer sentimentality to think there is some ultimate form any manufactured object should take. Oh, I agree. I, don't, I mean, the, the wireless, I would suggest, the next thing to try, because it is, after all, immaterial. Its function is, in the literal sense, immaterial. Why not try to make it invisible? Not by sticking it behind the panels of the wall, which is a good enough way of doing it, but... Um, some other way. I mean, I, I give the designers that. It's worth a try. Something floating in the air that you can't see. But no, they've what? gone wild because they've made it so technical now. This is the thing I can't cope with. I couldn't cope with it when it was in Queen Anne legs because <laughs> you thought it, you expected to find a cocktail cabinet yes, and therefore exactly. that really mucked you up when you went there for a sly drink. <laughs> but um, I can't cope with it now because it's so. it looks so technical and therefore I am very disturbed about the radio. But the moment. funny thing you is... You don't look a bit I... disturbed as a matter of fact, but I know what you mean. You're using broadcasting speak when you say I'm so disturbed. Paul I'm very I'm terribly worried about, worried yes, about Jim. Exactly. Yes, yes. I, know, I know what you mean. What this book does raise, whether we're talking about how much it, it, it is it about manipulation or not, is the f- wonder of whether the, the, the curiosity about whether you really do have any design sense yourself or not. Uh, because not recently, I came across an article which said the following aspects are now out in any design of a flat, and I could tick off every single one <laughs> which was there. I mean, it said, for example, that pelmets are now in, fitted carpets are out, uh, bright colours are in, but certainly certainly not sort of matte colours, paint, but only if it's sort of like crusty paint, uh, pictures, single pictures, not all together, fitted kitchens are completely out, strip pine is totally out. Now, all this thing, this is a large account. Now, what worried me was that this was a perfect account of everything that was in my flat. So I must have got everything into my flat because I'd seen yet another article which said all these things were in. And the belief that I lacked any sense of taste at all was brought home to me by an article that I read in New Society which pointed out that everybody, it said, by now was wearing boxer shorts (laughs) instead of those Y-front underpants. And I thought, it's only the fact that I haven't been able to see that they are that's left me in Y-front underpants until today. I want no further revelations. Anne Leslie, the Reverend Roger Royal, Stephen Oliver and Professor Laurie Taylor were stopping the week with Robert Robinson. Dilly Keane provided the musical interlude and the programme was produced by Michael Ember. 